Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, everyone. It is so great to be in chapel. Actually, since the last time I was with you, I've been traveling a fair amount, and God's been doing great stuff. So just thank you for being here. I hope you sense the presence of God. Uh, you know, the scripture tells us whenever we gather in his name that he is present here, and that's a good thing. I was thinking about what should I share uh, with you since it's been uh, several weeks, and I was thinking about where we are in the semester, and I was, I don't want to depress you, but I was thinking, how many weeks till finals? Like four weeks, right? four, four or five weeks. I know it's a, I know it's a drag, okay, it's, it's okay. But um, so I was thinking about what should I uh, think about, and I was talking about uh, remembering, remembering, and being reminded. Uh, my wife and I had the privilege to raise five children, and uh, we had to remind them of some stuff on a regular basis, and maybe you'll resonate with this. Uh, one of the things we had to remind them is when they went outside and played in the mud to take their shoes off before they came in the house. Like that seemed like forever and ever and ever. We were re reminding over and over again. Uh, and, and the second thing is that when we were having dinner, we would regularly um, have to remind them to put the napkins on their laps, right? Like as a parent, you just do some things repetitively. And how many of you ever got reminded to put a napkin on a table on your lap? And some of you going, what's a napkin? But anyway, we, we did that as parents. And the third thing I was thinking about, what do we remind our kids of a lot? And uh, one of them was uh, to flush the toilet. Just regularly, it just seemed like if I said that once, I said it 10,000 times, flush the toilet, okay? So then I was thinking, okay, don't just think about your kids, John. What do you need to be reminded of? And to be honest, I, I, I just kind of came to this place where I said, I, I need to be honest about this. Um, sometimes uh, I, I either drive or, or a short distance go to the store to pick up just a few items, like maybe two or three items. And it used to be that I could just say, oh, I'll just pick up those three items. Today, if I don't write those items down in a note or a little sticky, I forget between my house and the store what two or three items I was supposed to pick up. Does anybody else have a, like a memory thing like that where you just forget? It goes out of your head. You, just, you listen to a song on the radio or something like that, and, and things uh, just happen. So what do we need to be reminded of? And so I was thinking about that. Um, when I last talked to you, I, I talked about a concept of uh, not just being consecrated, but being able to recognize that there's actually some foundations that we all need to be reminded of on a regular basis. I think we've got a picture I want to show you. It's a picture that um, I think kind of tells a story. It's a picture of uh, some tributaries that feed into a river. And when I say tributaries, I want you to think about streams. Uh, most of us have been somewhere in the wilderness and we've seen maybe a small stream, and they're all over this geography, where you just see a little tiny stream, I mean, barely a trickle of water. Uh, how many of you uh, don't really believe yet in Lake Jessup, like you're still waiting for it to be Lake Jessup? Well, I promise you, there is a lake there. You, you can't see it yet because the streams that feed into it are not yet flowing, but they will be. And yesterday uh, was a big help and more to come. But rivers generally are created by streams of water, streams of living water. And so I want to just talk to you today about living water. Whenever I'm talking to families and to students who are coming to Jessup, one of the things I'll say is that we are unequivocally Christ-centered. Now, somebody in this room will go like, well, that's good for you, but I I'm not a Christian. And I want you to know that Jesus is here for you. And somebody in this room might go like, well, hey, I was raised as a Christian, but the truth is I'm not exactly sure where I am. I said the little prayer when I was a kid, but I'm not really dialed in, and I just want you to know Jesus is here for you. And somebody else in this room might say, well, man, that's it. I, that's why I came to Jessup. I'm totally Jesus-focused, and I want to know what Jesus wants for my whole life, and I want you to know this, that Jesus is here for you. So when I was last with you, I talked about four kind of cornerstones, and I want you to think about them as streams that feed into a river. If you want your life to be a, a rushing river, if you want your life to be a powerful river, then you'll pay attention to these four streams. Just four quickly. Uh, salvation, that's about knowing Jesus and knowing forgiveness. Uh, spiritual growth, super important. A lot of you are experiencing that already in dynamic ways. That's about being rooted and grounded and, and then being equipped. And many of you are here at Jessup because this is your season to be equipped up for the rest of your life. In fact, at Jessup, one of the phrases that we increasingly are saying here is that we're all about people being equipped and being known. And I know you're experiencing the, the God-loving community. You're making some friends in, in the dorms and in the CAF and in your athletic events and arts. And by the way, we're getting ready to do a big, huge theatrical presentation. we got music presentations like crazy, choirs on tour, all kinds of fun stuff. But you're being uh, equipped. And then the third one is, our fourth one is ambassadorship. And that's something that you may know a little bit less about. So I just want to quickly unpack these four streams. And I want to say this to you. You're in this room because you're in one of these streams. 
You might be in more than one, but you're in one of these streams, and it's the dominant stream of your life right now. And in that stream, I want you to hear this, that I think God has a specific word for you today. And most of what I'm going to share in the next few moments is not my words, but it's the word of God. And the Bible tells us that the word of God never goes without its intended effect. That God's word, when spoken by me or anybody else or read by you, that the Holy Spirit will take that and impart that into your life. So I believe this, if you're ready, that there's one of these streams that will speak to you. Let's talk about the first one, the stream of salvation. I'm just going to read you some scriptures. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Here's my, you know, sort of John Jackson short notes that God's perfect and you're not, okay? So here's the deal. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're not perfect. Go ahead, you're not perfect. Now have that person say back to you, neither are you. Go ahead, neither are you, all right? So here's the deal. If, if you're in this room, you're not perfect. If you're watching online, you're not perfect. All have sinned. All have missed the mark. All have fallen short of the glory, the perfection, the holiness, the awesomeness of God. All of us are a little bit messed up. And whether you're a little bit messed up or a lot messed up, the reality is none of us are perfect. Romans 6.23 says this, The wages of sin, so the just, what we deserve, is death to be forever separated from God. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. How many of you know that God likes to give gifts? God likes to give gifts. He gets a lot of joy about giving gifts. A pastor friend of mine uh, has a great sort of uh, heritage. And his birthday, what he does is give gifts to all his grandkids. So guess what? His grandkids love his birthday. <laughs> That's such a cool thing. I'm eventually going to get that mature, but I'm not right now. I want gifts myself. So the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus the Lord. Third one, uh, John 1.12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, the name of Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. The coolest thing to me about that passage is no matter where you came from, no matter what your family background is, no matter what your story is, rich, poor, black, white, brown, uh, male, female, uh, educated, uneducated, whatever, if you receive Jesus, you become a child of God. That's like the most incredible thing. It, in some ways, whatever happened in the past, it all pales in comparison to the fact that God wants to give you the gift of salvation, forgiveness, and freedom, and he wants you to become his kid. Now, to be honest, just think about it this way. If Bill Gates called you tomorrow, kind of a wealthy dude, if uh, Mark Zuckerberg called you tomorrow, kind of a wealthy dude, and said to you, hey, I'd like to adopt you and give you a portion of the inheritance of all the wealth that I have, how long would it take you to sign the papers? Some of you go, like, I'm calculating right now. Well, that's just stuff. All that stuff's going to burn. The fact is, the God who made heaven and earth is saying to you right now, I want to be your father. I want to be your loving, caring, perfect, never missing a beat, never falling short, never disappointing father. Wow. See, the reality is I think that John 3, 16, 17, which you probably have heard before and seen at football games with somebody with orange hair, says this, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But this is the verse that a lot of people don't read. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Some of you, the stream of salvation is where you are right now. And to be honest, you've kind of been uh, like uh, Tim Allen from Home Improvement. You've been looking over the fence. That's an old uh, sitcom in case you don't remember that reference. But uh, you're looking over the fence. You've kind of been peering at Christianity and you've heard stuff in the media. You've heard stuff with family background. But you don't really know what it means to be in the stream of salvation. Because quite frankly, you got some baggage from your past. you got your ba some baggage from right now. You're unclear whether the God who made heaven and earth could really love somebody like you. And I'm telling you, every page of scripture is written with this word to you. God loves you. God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world. He sent Jesus in the world so that we could be saved. The Bible word for saved, saved means saved, healed, and delivered. Delivered from our brokenness, delivered from our past. The stream of salvation is, is for some of you right today. To know that God loves you so much. And although God is perfect and we're not, that he has bridged that gap with the person and work of Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross for our sins, made it possible for us to know him. And for some of you, today's the day where you're going to say, yes, I want to be saved.
I want salvation. I want in that stream. Others of you, you've been in the salvation stream, and where you really are needing to focus is the issue of spiritual growth. I'm just going to read one passage, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. It says, so then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your life in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See, the truth is, is that once you are in the stream of salvation, you get opportunity to move into the stream of spiritual growth. And that's where some of you are. But the Bible's really clear about this in this passage. When we receive Christ, we don't just do that as a one-moment experience. We do that as an encounter that transcends and, over, and superintends the rest of our lives. When you receive Jesus, the Bible says you actually start living in him. The Bible says when you receive Jesus, he forgives you of your sins, and he gives his Holy Spirit to live inside of you. In another passage of scripture, it says the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Now, you may not feel that way. You may not experience that. But the Bible says that when Jesus comes into your life, he gives his Holy Spirit into your life as well. And so just as you receive Christ, you're supposed to live in him. Then it says you're supposed to be rooted and built up in him. You're supposed to be strengthened and overflowing with thankfulness. Let me just tell you this. All of Christianity is about Jesus. Jesus-centered Christianity is something that we definitely need more of. And in that passage, it tells us that we should not only be strengthened and rooted, but we should be overflowing with thankfulness. And here's a quick way to think about it. If you're in the stream of spiritual growth, you should be leaking Jesus everywhere you go. There's another passage in Scripture that puts it another way. It says this, that God has taken heavenly treasure... That's the person and work of Jesus, and he's put it in earthen vessels. A kind of a simple way to say that is that God has poured precious oil, precious cargo into cracked pots. Go ahead, turn to the person next to you and say, you're a cracked pot. Go ahead and say that. Now turn back to the person and say, so are you. You're a cracked pot. So here's the reality, folks. We're in a room, we're watching online, we're, we're with people who are all cracked pots. We're all human. We all have the reality of our stuff. And it's amazing to me, I wouldn't do it if I was God, but it's amazing to me that God himself, who made heaven and earth, decides to pour heavenly treasure into messed up crackpots like you and like me. Why does God do that? It's so that when people will see us, they will know it's not about us. When you live your life and good and God-honoring things happen in your life, it's not about you. Jessup is not about the institution. Jessup is about Jesus. I was in a, that's good, you can clap, let's go, come on. I was in a, um, I was in a secular setting recently, you know, a public marketplace setting, and they were asking me to talk a little bit about Jessup, and I just, I don't know, I felt a little boldness that day, a little quirkiness. I had the microphone, and I said, well, you know, here's the deal. If you want to know everything about Jessup, I told them a little bit of our programs and stuff, told them about you, but then I said, here's the deal. Really, the truth is, what's different about Jessup is that Jesus is in our name. And then you could tell the room kind of went quiet because you're not supposed to say the name of Jesus in public places. So I said, no, I'm serious. You can take the microphone away from me. But what makes Jessup different is that Jesus is not only in our name, he's on our campus. And he's in our students and he's in our staff and he's in our faculty. And I really got rolling. And then they, I thought they were going to take the microphone away. And I said, so anyway, that's what's different about Jessup. You want to meet Jesus, come to Jessup. So for some of you, that's the stream you're in. You're just going like, man, I just need to grow. I need to know more. I was like this for a lot of my life, but I'm starting to grow. And professors are challenging you, and other students are challenging you. And that stream of spiritual growth is rich, and it will last for the rest of your life. By the way, every single one of these streams go on and on, and they feed in to this mighty rushing river that is God's destiny for your life. The third stream is the stream of equipping. This is a lengthy passage, so I'm going to read it kind of quick. It's only one passage I'm going to read, but it's such a powerful one. Ephesians 4 says, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to, his, quick, to equip his people for works of service. Why do pa pastors and spiritual leaders equip you for the work of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of Son of God? And let me just stop right here. I know siblings squabble all the time. I know families squabble. I know sometimes good friends squabble. Can I say this? I think it breaks the heart of God when sons and daughters of the Most High expend their energy fighting against each other. 
I do not think that's the will of God. In fact, I think the will of God in John 17, Jesus prays with drops of blood sweat coming from his brow that we would be one as he and the Father are one. So he goes on to say this, that we reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. You want a short definition of what spiritual maturity is, of being equipped, is that you become completely like Jesus. So let me ask you this, when do you plan to stop being equipped? Not until the day you draw your last breath on this planet. The day you draw your last, last breath on this planet is the day you stop being equipped to become more mature. It's the day you stop growing spiritually. And somebody once said that the goal of living as a follower of Jesus is so you live in this life and become more and more like Jesus so that when you pass from this life to the next, in that moment, there has to be as little change as possible. Because we know, by the way, when we step from this life as a follower of Jesus into the next life, the Bible says in an instant we'll be transformed and become like him. It goes on to say this. Why do we want to be mature? Then we'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who's the head. That is Christ From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up as each part does its work. Can I tell you what equipping is all about? Equipping is all about growing into maturity. And when we grow to maturity, we become more and more like Jesus. So if you're in the stream of being equipping, like if that's, like you're growing spiritually, you've experienced the stream of salvation, but where you are right now is you are being equipped. You're sensing that God is calling things from you. God is actually stirring gifts up in you you didn't even know you had. People who love you and care about you are spotting things in you and say, you know, you're really gifted at that. I don't know if you've ever had the privilege of having that experience where somebody could come to you and say, you know, I see this in you. You know, I just, I've been watching you and kind of been around your life for a while. Something seems to be bubbling to the surface. Well, I believe that the journey of growing to spiritual maturity and being equipped for what God has for us is a stream that feeds into a mighty rushing river. And that stream of equipping helps you to become mature. But you know what? You got to read this last part of the passage. In the last part of the passage, it says this, the body builds itself up as each part does its work. You know the cool thing about God? No spare parts. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have a place in his body. You have a, face, a place in his family. You have a role in the kingdom. The reality is, is that that stream of equipping means you have an assignment. A lot of us, I think, signed up for passive Christianity. What we want is to someday in the sweet by and by go to heaven, play a harp, float on clouds, walk on streets of gold, and not go to the other bad place that's as hot as Palm Springs or Phoenix or Sacramento this past summer. So we want to avoid all that. But you know what? That's not how the Bible describes the life of walking with Jesus. There's a passage in the New Testament that says the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. When God's life is coming out of you and you're growing spiritually and you're getting equipped for what he's assigned you to do, you will be so focused, so like, this is what I was made for. I'm not going to focus too much on her, but I'm looking at, Jackie is here today and Jackie's a street preacher and Jackie has this ministry and I remember Jackie when she was a student here. She's an alum now involved in ministry. I remember Jackie when she was a student here and I remember seeing and sensing and other people, key professors here, pouring into her life and saying, look, we believe in you and you need to talk to Jackie afterwards. If you go like, I I don't know, you were always like this, right? Uh Uh-uh. I remember Jackie before she was Jackie. Well, actually, she was still Jackie back then, but the Jackie she is now is a person that's been equipped, a person who's leaned in and said, God, what would you have for me? What do you want me to do? That's the prayer I pray that all of us will pray. God, what would you have me to do? What's my life all about? What's my purpose? How can I get equipped? Those three streams are powerful streams, but I think they culminate in the fourth stream, and that's the stream of ambassadorship. Again, one passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If anyone's in Christ, the new creation has come. The old's gone, the new's here. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Just a quick question. Have you ever been really torqued with a friend of yours? 
if they're next to you, don't raise your hand. But if, if, have you ever been like really upset, like somebody did you wrong, somebody did you dirty, maybe it was a family member, maybe it was a friend, and you just were like at that place where if you could have seen them and, and you, know, you might have like wanted to think or do violent things. You just were angry and they were angry with you and you were at odds. And if that's ever happened with you, have you ever had the experience of being angry with somebody and dealing with the issue face to face and finally having the conflict and then getting it resolved? and asking forgiveness, and having them ask for forgiveness, and both of you kind of like owned whatever your stuff was, and you got to the point where you actually were reconciled with that person again. Like, that's sweet, man. That, that, that's some good stuff. That's like a thimble compared to the ocean of the reality that we were separated from God and God made it possible for us to be reconciled to him because of what he did in Jesus Christ in that salvation experience at the cross. But once we get reconciled to God, once we experience the ocean full of forgiveness and love and care he has for us, the Bible says that he's actually committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now again, I don't get God in a lot of ways. If I'm God and I want people to hear good news, I don't entrust it to me. I have some sort of heavenly amplification system and I just speak from heaven. Wouldn't it be amazing if I could speak from heaven as a perfect and holy God and speak to each individual by name? Oh, if he's God, I guess he can do that. So wouldn't it be awesome if God could just like sky write or laser write and, and speak to us and then tell us stuff about our life? Oh, he's God, he can do that. Why doesn't God do that? This passage tells me that the stream of ambassadorship is part of what we're being equipped for, that God has actually given every single one of us who know the name of Jesus an ambassadorship on earth. He goes forward to say this, the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. How many of you know that's good news? Amen. To not have your sins counted against you, that's like amazing. He goes on to say, He's committed to us the message of reconciliation. We're therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The word implore there in that text means beg. We beg you. Paul's saying in this letter to the Corinthian church, we actually are the people who get the privilege of begging with people, pleading with people to come to know Jesus. And I think streams come together and form a mighty river. And I just want to ask you this question. Is your life a mighty rushing river? Or is it a trickle that feels like a California drought that's never ending? I've been there. I know what it feels like to feel like what was a mighty rushing river is just a trickle. And in my own personal story, I've never doubted my salvation. But there were times where even my salvation seemed like it was a little dry. I want you to know this. God has provided these streams, the stream of salvation, the stream of spiritual growth, the stream of equipping, and the stream of ambassadorship so that your life can be a mighty, rushing river. And I just want to be honest. Some of you today, the Bible has a passage. It's, it says that people have left their first love. Some of you need to go back to the stream of salvation. And you need to weep. You need to weep because what you deserve is to be forever separated from God. But God loved you so much that Jesus died on the cross. And I know you've heard that, some of you, 10,000 times. But God in heaven, to hang on the cross instead of barbecuing the people around him who were doing that stuff, I'd have done that. I'd have, I'd have instantaneous barbecue, right? And just, oh, you want to see power? Boom. It would have happened. I mean, that's, that's just me in the, in the natural. But Jesus hangs on the cross with all the power to do that. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he stays on the cross so I could know God. 
He stays on the cross so he could be my father. He stays on the cross so he could be your father. Some of you, that stream of salvation, you've never really gotten in. And I need you to know this, that God loves you. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you. And he longs for you to say, God, if you're real, I just open my heart and I surrender. Like that song that we sang, I just surrender. I give you everything. You make that decision, that's the most important decision in your life. Way more important than what you major in in college. Way more important than how cool the food is in the, in the calf. Way better than any experience you're ever going to have in life is the decision to say yes. Some of you need to get in that river of salvation. For others of you, you've been in that river, but to be honest, the river of spiritual growth, the stream of spiritual growth is a trickle. It's hardly there. And God is pleading with you, press into me. As you receive Christ, continue to live in him. Be rooted and grounded in his love and grow up to maturity in him. For some of you, the stream of spiritual growth, man, that's where you need to be. I know you got finals in a few weeks. I know you got Thanksgiving break coming up. I know life. I, I get it. Please believe me, I get it. But the single most important decision you could make today is to come to know Jesus as Savior. And the second one is to get in the stream of spiritual growth and say, my life is about growing closer to Jesus. Third thing is the stream of equipping. I think that's for a lot of you here in this room. You're here in part because you want to get equipped to be who God created you to be. And you know when you're in the zone, you know when you're doing what you were made to do, that there's this rush that happens, and God is pleased. So whether it's an art show, or an athletic contest, or a laboratory, or an essay, or a conversation in the hall, or working with foster kids in the community, you know when you're in the zone. And God's calling you to be equipped to fulfill his calling on your life. The last dream is the stream of ambassadorship, and I just want you to know this. Maybe today, maybe today, maybe today, maybe today you're supposed to have a conversation with someone and say, you know, I, I, I don't want to be rude and I don't want to intrude, but I do want to ask you this. Do you know where you are with God? Do you know that God loves you? Maybe today is the day that you are an ambassador. I'm going to close with this. I don't think up front is where ambassadorship happens. Ambassadorship is out there. And by the way, I do my ambassadorship not from up here. I'm an ambassador when I'm in the hallway. I'm an ambassador when I'm out in the marketplace. I'm an ambassador in my neighborhood. Ambassadorship is wherever the soles of your feet take you. Close your eyes right now. Holy Spirit, I'm not begging you to be in this place because I know you were here long before I arrived today. Holy Spirit, I'm praying that you touch lives. Take all my words and put them aside. But I pray that your word, that the word of God, that the everlasting, faithful, and true Son of God, that Jesus might be revealed today. Lord, somebody in this room needs to jump into the stream of salvation, and today will be the day. They will mark it down. And say, on this date in November 2022 is when I got born. I became a new creation. I became spiritually brand new. Somebody else in this room is going to say, hey, this is the moment. I want to mark this moment. Today's the day where I said yes to spiritual growth. I don't any longer want to be shallow. Or I don't anymore want to be one of those Christians who just kind of detached and passive. I want to be in the stream. I want to be growing and pressing in. And I want to understand what the Bible says. And I want to understand what it means. I want to pray and I want to worship. And I want to connect my heart with other believers. And so, Jesus, some are going to jump into that stream today. And so, Holy Spirit, would you tap on hearts, touch minds, encourage decisions. Some of us in this room, God, are saying, man, for the first time, I just, I got a vision for who I'm supposed to be. I never knew that that delight in the laboratory or that delight in reading or writing and that delight in teaching or sharing or loving or, or encouraging or that delight on the court, or that delight in the studio or on the stage, that that actually was a God thing in me. So Jesus, would you call forth the equipping vision and ministry that you have for women and men in this place? 
call them forth to maturity and call them forth to mission. And then God, I just come before you and I just pray for ambassadorship. I pray that every son or daughter of the Most High would not leave this place and go, okay, that's cool, I'm out. But instead would say, man, I am an ambassador that literally on behalf of the God of heaven and earth, I want to beg, I want to implore people to be reconciled to God through what Jesus did on the cross. God, those four streams happen, the river of our life will be a mighty, powerful force for the kingdom. We ask these things in your awesome, amazing, precious name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Amen.